Ladies and gentlemen, help me make this gentleman feel welcome. A tremendous, tremendous man, and a man I know that we will all appreciate his inspirational message tonight, Dr. Patrick Hardy. speech. I'm going to start at $100. <laughs> no formalities, just thank you for having me. Um, this is an honor, and it's absolutely a privilege, and I appreciate it. Dr. Martin Luther King, he had a dream, and that dream became his mantra in his death. All of us know the famous lines of his speech delivered August 28, 1963, the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. We remember the legendary words of that speech during which he stated so passionately, I have a dream. So many people remember the words, I have a dream, but few can explain the actual context of the statements he made within that speech. They cannot recall the words before or the words after. Few actually know that these celebrated and well-known lines came towards the end of a much longer and very serious soliloquy. Few actually know that this section of the speech during which he so passionately repeats, I have a dream, was actually not even part of the actual text. He improvised it. It wasn't even written. Not many people know that the words, I have a dream, are not the title of his speech. It was originally called Normalcy, Never Again. And Dr. King changed his speech, and he changed the title a few times, simply settling on the title Normalcy Speech. We know it as I have a dream because these were popular lines. But listen to a portion of what he actually said. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair, I say to you today, my friends. And so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. You see, Dr. King dreamed of a day when discrimination and segregation would no longer exist and we would all be treated equally no matter our ethnic background or our culture. Later in life, Dr. King dreamed, and this is important, his dream involved, evolved to focus on the elimination of poverty. Dr. King had come to understand and believe strongly that his idea of equality could not exist and could not totally be fulfilled while slums and ghettos and homelessness and high unemployment remain the stark reality. So we gather here today understanding that we have made significant progress towards his dream. The fact that we're in the same room is a testimony to that. The fact that this young African-American man stands before you today is a testimony to that. So given the context of everything I just told you, I'm thankful to be here. And it should make sense to you that I take this moment very seriously. So let me, came, let me say what I came to say, and I'll get out of your way. News bulletin. We have not totally fulfilled Dr. King's dream. We have absolutely made significant progress on one front, and that is against segregation and discrimination. We've made significant progress. 
but we continue to get outflanked by poverty, homelessness, and unemployment. Here in the Freeport area, our per capita personal income is well below that of the rest of the country. When examining our income, we know that the overall net earnings decline when it's disaggregated by place of residence. Our median income is below that of the rest of the state. Our data tells us that unemployment in Freeport is way too high, and job creation is virtually non-existent. We graduate a reasonable number of high school students. However, we struggle to attract and retain those with an education with training beyond high school. It's called the brain drain. Anecdotally, longtime residents of Freeport will tell you quickly that this was once a fine city. But they will also tell you truthfully that several neighborhoods are now in decay. Property owners seem to care less and less about their neighborhoods and about the appearance of their properties. And, some are, and in some neighborhoods, this problem of not caring is worse than in others. With this kind of information, I'm duty-bound to repeat the words of Dr. King that I read to you earlier. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, and so even though we face difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. This was his dream. But how do we move from his dream to our own vision? Having a clear and sustained and well-articulated vision is critical and it's the first thing we lack. No one has articulated a clear, precise vision for how we bring life to this city and how we make it a beacon for this region. How do I know there is no vision? Because the people don't know. They don't know what the vision is for economic growth. They don't know what the vision is for business development. They don't know what the vision is for job creation, for youth programming, each of which would cover our flank against poverty. Patrick, how do you know that the people don't know? In part, because I researched you before I came. <laughs> and when I asked, the people didn't know. When I asked your high school students, they didn't know. And this is a fatal error. <laughs> Y'all gonna be mad at me. <laughs> this is an important and fatal error when the people don't know. I read a little book. I can't get into it tonight. But it's about a guy, he had 12 friends, they killed him. In that book, it says this, where there is no vision, the people perish. Another translation of that very same line, I almost said scripture, line. <laughs> another translation says it this way, where there is no vision, watch this, the people cast off restraint. <laughs> Someone in this room must take the lead and cast a vision for this city. It's important because the people are casting off restraint. We are running in every direction with no destination in mind. Your children are casting off restraint and going their own way. When the people are not driven by a vision, and towards a vision. They go their own way. It is the vision that restrains and constrains the people. It keeps them moving in a common direction, speaking a common language while sharing a common thought. The vision gives the people hope. 
that while we have not arrived yet, we have a goal. <laughs> the vision gives the people a sense of hope that while we have not arrived yet, we are moving with a sense of purpose. Someone must cast a vision so that the people understand how important it is to do the simple things like cut the grass and clean the yard, line the street. Someone must cast a vision so that our young people can dream again. I met with a group of students who recently asked me to change the logo at the high school because being a pretzel sucks. <laughs> because you haven't told them the rich sense of history they have. If people can put cheese on their heads <laughs> and proudly declare <laughs> if Virginia Tech can be proud of being referred to as a hokey, a duck. <laughs> we haven't taught them to have a sense of pride in who they are. Someone must cast a vision. Let me move on. They gave me two hours to speak. I won't take that long. <laughs> someone, <laughs> someone must cast a vision so that sensible people can ignore the blogging about how horrible the city is. Someone must cast a vision so that the people will stop casting off their restraints. Someone must move us forward. Now, before I go on, let me deal with the thought that may be flowing through the room right now. Let me just say it. You're thinking, Dr. Hardy, you're not a politician or a businessman. These are complex issues that are affected by outside entities, maybe at the state level and at the federal level. And these things are complex. I agree with you. I'm not a businessman or a politician. And I may not understand all of these things, but here is one thing I do understand. Ain't nobody coming to save us. We have to stop waiting on the federal government. They ain't coming. We have to stop waiting for politicians to stop arguing about Democrat versus Republican. They won't do it. We have to stop waiting on the state of Illinois to get out of debt, pay its bills on time, balance the budget, stop arguing and stop making excuses. They can't do it. We're broke. We need a vision from right here. And dare I say, right now. What are we waiting for? Our city needs game changers that won't sit by and wait for the next opportunity to come. But they leverage the opportunities that are at hand right now. We need a vision that moves us with purpose. Now I speak as a citizen, not as a politician or anything more than I am right now. When I say this, the people will not crucify you for having a vision. Stop being afraid. They will not revolt if we shoot for the stars and only get the moon. They're not going to burn the city down. I believe sensible people will understand how hard it is to reach every single goal you set. Sensible people will understand that. But they will appreciate the fact that you at least had a goal. We need a vision. We need a vision. But more than the vision itself, we need a sense of innovation. Am I talking to the right people? And a willingness to reinvent ourselves 
and often if necessary. In 1887, the son of a Japanese cotton farmer was born in Hamamatsu, Japan, which is just south of Tokyo. When he grew up, he became a carpenter and was considered very enterprising. In 1909, he constructed a pedal-driven loom and started to sell his product, which did quite well. So well that in the 1920s, the company was introduced to the stock exchange, so business was booming. His company was exporting looms all over Southeast Asia and India. Two problems occurred, though. First, his product was built so well that it saturated the market, and there was no need to buy any new ones. The second thing that happened was war. So his company had to do something to survive. And he remembered they were good at building machines. So the company began to build small motors, attaching them to bicycles. And they sold like crazy. He wasn't the first to do it. He just did it better. Eventually, his company became known and is still known as one of the best motorcycle manufacturers in the world. His name was Michio Suzuki. And his company is known now as the Suzuki Motor Company but it was first called the Suzuki Loom Manufacturing Company. In times of challenge, Suzuki found opportunity and reinvented his company and ultimately became a powerhouse. We too have a rich history. Pretzels, Lincoln Douglas, Rockefeller, manufacturing, insurance. But I contend that we need a vision and that vision must include reinvention if we are to reinvigorate this city. And to those who say, no, 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 let's wait for the federal government. We can't affect change in this environment by ourselves. I say, you haven't been paying attention. Nashville is not waiting. Seattle is not waiting. Dell didn't wait. Walmart didn't wait. Southwest Airlines isn't waiting. Home Depot isn't waiting. Starbucks isn't waiting. eBay did not wait. And Suzuki did not wait. All of these entities reinvented themselves and continue to reinvent themselves and their industry because the economy demands it. They did not do it because someone wrote a manual that says, here's how you save yourself, and they mailed it to them. <laughs> these folks brought together their best minds, watch this, and determined a new path, and they achieved. Freeport does not lack the great minds. We just lack the courageous leadership to bring together the great minds. The economic situation demands that we reinvent, and the people need it desperately. Time won't permit me, I got to go, <laughs> to deeply into this subject, but I got to say one more thing. In order to move from Dr. King's dream to our vision, we must under undertake four critical, important tasks. We must evaluate our culture, our leadership, our organizational capabilities, and our methodology. These are simply four of the elements that the industries I just mentioned evaluated when they made change. First, we must evaluate our culture to determine if the complaining and griping is of any benefit to anything, anytime. <laughs> if I hear one more time that Freeport sucks, I'm a straight slap somebody. <laughs> I'm tired of being asked, why did you come here with a Harvard degree? It's not entertaining anymore, y'all. <laughs> I'm tired of being asked, why did you bring your family here? And I wish my students were here to hear this. I'm tired of being asked to leave. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't in the speech, man. <laughs> and now I lost my place. We have a culture that exudes self-hatred. I'm sorry, you shouldn't have gave me the microphone. <laughs> we hate ourselves, and we're so willing to say it out loud to anyone who will listen. And so, we need a group of great minds to come together and create a new vision for our city, and they must determine if this culture helps us. And if this is the case that it doesn't help, we must create a new culture and then we must promote it and propagate it. 
Second, those great minds must come together and evaluate our leadership. What are the business, political, and, e and educational leaders doing? Is that leadership effective? Does our leadership work to unify us or divide us? Does our leadership solve problems or create problems? Those great minds must determine the three or four things that great leaders must do in order to change us. Then we have to tell them and hold accountable and unseat them if we have to. I said it, sorry. I got two claps on that. There must we're afraid to have that kind of talk. We're afraid to go to our leaders and say, this is what we demand of you. Stop pursuing your own agenda, pursue ours. What would happen if we revolted in the streets? There must be a willingness to, to do this, knowing that those doing the evaluating will likely be evaluating themselves. Can you take constructive criticism? Third, that team of critical thinkers must analyze and evaluate our organizational capabilities. Does the city have the organizational capacity and infrastructure to bring about real change? What are our strengths? What are our areas for growth? And last, that meeting of the minds must evaluate our methodology. Is what we're doing working? There's an organization. It's called Freeport Alive. Freeport Alive. The members of this organization include leaders from business, education, finance, the medical field and health fields, politics, and various grassroots and community-based organizations here in the Freeport community. Freeport Alive believes at its core that this city is still alive and well. It believes that our best years are ahead of us, not behind us. Freeport Alive is convinced that those who believe in this city must unify their voices and speak loudly that there are still people here and we are not dead yet. Freeport Alive states that its overall goal is to create and sustain collaboration between Freeport area organizations in order to positively impact the community and create a vibrant city for our future and for our children. Its mission statement is simple, stay with me. To bring about organizations, to bring community organizations and resources into alignment so that their coordinated support of Freeport's development has a positive impact on the, sex, on the success of the community as a whole. Sounds wonderful. Freeport Alive has four subcommittees. The first is education and youth. Focuses on alignment of community resources to support our schools and other viable youth programs. The second subcommittee is called History and Culture. These are organizations and resources that are aligned to positively market our city to the wider community, celebrate our various cultures through events and publications, and create and sustain programming that celebrate our rich history. The third subcommittee is called Economic Development. That one's pretty obvious. This subcommittee obviously focuses on alignment of resources and organizations for the purpose of job creation and identifying opportunities for growth in the various sectors that affect our local economy. The fourth subcommittee is called Neighborhood Development. This group focuses on the alignment of resources that create and sustain a collaborative effort to improve the physical quality of our local neighborhoods. If effective, Freeport Alive could change the trajectory of our city Freeport Alive could unify our citizens in a manner not observed in years. Freeport Alive could ensure that we are constantly innovating and collaborating for the express purpose of positively changing our community. Freeport Alive could change us by reminding us that our separate efforts pale in comparison to collaborative and sustained planning and implementation. There's one problem with Freeport Alive. It doesn't exist. Freeport Alive is a vision I conjured up in my head for this speech. But it could exist. You can have it, I won't sell it to you. <laughs> my mother used to say there's some truth in every joke. You see, the point of that is to say this. Freeport is still alive. 
And so I would like to end tonight by gracefully and humbly borrowing some of the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. He ended his speech that day with what I think are some of his most powerful words. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, <laughs> of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. But understand that if Freeport is to be a great city, a progressive city, a vibrant city, we must let Freeport ring. So let Freeport ring from the east side to the west side. Let Freeport ring from our cornfields to our baseball fields. Let Freeport ring from Highland Community College to Taylor Park. But not only that, let freedom ring from the easternmost parts of South Street. Let Freeport ring from Crape Park. Let Freeport ring from Galena Street and Chicago Ave and Carroll Street. And when this happens, when we allow Freeport to ring, when we allow Freeport to shine from every house and every business, from every school and every city street, we will be able to speed up that day when all of our citizens, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, young people and the elderly, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands in singing the words of that old Negro spiritual, alive at last, alive at last. Thank God Almighty, Freeport is alive at last. Thank you.